Hello and welcome to this morning's webinar, Exporting a Beginner's Guide, brought to you as part of our MAP and Bridge and Craig Avon Council's flagship business support programme, Transform Your Business. This programme is part funded by Invest Northern Ireland and the European Regional Development Fund under the Investment for Growth and Jobs for Northern Ireland programme. We're delighted to have you with us today. And for those of you who are on the social channels, please feel free to use um, through Twitter, Facebook and Instagram, the hashtags transform your business pro program and hashtag ABC early export. My name is Claire McGee and I'll be your host for today's webinar and along with Barney Toll, we are the co-founders of Innovate NI. We currently deliver the Transform Your Business Programme and the Grant Application Support Programme on behalf of ABC Council. Shortly, we'll be joined by Paul Harding, who will lead today's session, helping you to understand the basics of getting ready to export, highlighting what you need to know, navigating where to start, and outlining those crucial initial steps to export success. We'll open up at the end for any questions, so please, throughout the session, use the Q&A function to submit your questions and also use the chat facility and um, to chat with the panelists and ourselves. But firstly, I'd like to introduce Alderman Glenn Barr, Lord Mayor of Armagh Van Bridge and Craig Avon Council, who has joined us this morning to welcome you all here. Good morning, everyone, and hope you're keeping well in this wild, windy morning. Um, Forgive me, but the, my bins are bouncing about outside, and that's all, all I can hear. Um, on behalf of our Mass City, Bombers and Craig Avonburg Council, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to this webinar, Exporting a Be Beginner's Guide. This webinar is part of our Transform Your Business program, which provides free mentoring and advice to local businesses on a wide range of topics, including exporting, innovation, and digital. It also provides specific support for social enterprises and for young entrepreneurs. Although the exporting landscape continues to evolve, the benefits and opportunities associated with selling outside of Northern Ireland are so important to growing the local economy. Today, we will hear from industry expert, Paul Harding, who will discuss export process and give an over overview for the required documentation for the movement of your goods. We would like to thank Paul for joining us today and also express my thanks to Claire and Barney from Innovate NI, who are delivering the Transform Your Business Programme on behalf of Council. So thank you very much and stay safe in this wild, windy day. Thank you, Lord Mayor, um, for joining us and for your kind words of encouragement to the businesses in the borough um, to explore export markets. And you're right, let, let's hope that Storm Barra doesn't um, interfere too much um, with our technology this morning. So thank you very much. So let's get export ready. I'm delighted to welcome Paul Harding to your screens. Paul is an export sales professional with over 30 years experience gained across a range of sectors. He cut his teeth in the leisure marine industry with Bangor company, Whale Water Systems, and then took a small Dutch manufacturer from zero to 500K in export sales over a number of years. Currently, he works with a small local company which imports US manufactured products and resells them in Europe. He speaks three foreign languages, no less, and for the last 17 years has been a self-employed export mentor, supporting mostly small companies to get into export markets, both direct to customers and through distribution. He has been on the export scene a long time and has delivered export workshops for Invest NI, Enterprise Ireland and a range of regional council programmes. So I'm just going to pass over to you, Paul. You just want to pop on your camera? No, yeah, it's all right. Here we go. Yeah, it was on. Hey, nice. Yeah, I don't know. There we go. Oh, for goodness sake. Right. Here 
you want to share the screen? Yeah, that's right. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, Paul Harding is my name, and you're welcome to this webinar on the basics of exporting. So it's really the, the start process. Uh, it lasts probably about 45 minutes. If I disappear stage left at any time, it's because my bins have been blown around the garden. But uh, in any case, um, if that doesn't happen, and if the power also uh, doesn't play havoc, um, I hope you enjoy it. I hope you stick with it and uh, take away at least something to help you on your uh, on your way. So I don't know exactly where people are in uh, in terms of the um, their export effort. I suppose some have started, some looking at options, some thinking about exporting. I imagine a number of people uh, may have had a couple of incidental orders from other markets and are thinking about developing that. So. You'll no doubt have different perspectives um, uh, and context uh, for the webinar. Some of it may be very straightforward to you uh, and obvious. Um, I've just tried to encapsulate some of my experiences over the years into a very short space of time. <clears throat> so one thing I would like to do occasionally is to ask the odd question, which you can reply to in the, uh, in the chat function. You won't see anybody else's chat, but Claire will be able to uh, to gather uh, what's what's said. It'll only be a couple of times and, and fairly simple uh, questions relating to exporting. So I should uh, really uh, reiterate that my observations are based on my own experience of exporting for over 30 years. Um, to give you a bit more context, I have spent most of my working life in exporting with small companies, probably similar in size to some of you. And by small, I mean that the biggest is less than about 150 people, and right down as far as the family business with less than five employees. So I understand the constraints and the difficulties that small companies have. Um, a little bit of repetition from what Claire said, I did uh, begin and, and spend most of my early time in export selling with, uh, with well, thanks, thanks Claire, with whale pumps uh, in Bangor. Um, some of you may know it. It's a manufacturer of manual and low voltage uh, pumps for use mostly in mobile applications, mainly boats and caravans. They do have uh, some specialty products for other sectors. And the company has also diversified into heating for caravans, but principally it's still pumps. Uh, and I was head of sales and marketing there, responsible for about 12 million pounds of sales globally. And I simply decided I needed to do go and do something else. Um, Claire. So uh, I left after about 11 years and went uh, self-employed as a, I suppose, an export sales manager for hire. Um, I worked uh, as a sales guy, sales guy for a US export agent. Uh, we sold marine equipment on behalf of US manufacturers into Europe. So that was coming from the US into Europe um, and I worked with a, a small portable seat um, manufacturer there uh, uh, in Europe. It was a Dutch company and I did all their sales around Europe. <clears throat> Started from zero and we went to uh, 500 grand in a number of years. Um, I also worked with an election uh, equipment manufacturer in Derry called Packflat and some of you may know them. Um, uh, and I've, I have an example, a couple of examples that I use later on, which uh, which um, concern fact that. Uh, uh, and right now, amongst other things, uh, I'm working with a very small company, um, which brings products, Northern Ireland Company, which brings products in from the US and sells them around Europe, similar to what I used to do. Some of it we buy, some of it we distribute. Uh, so we, some of it we buy and distribute, some of it we uh, we act as an agent for. And we've also got our own developed and manufactured product, which is starting to, uh, to get some traction. So the reason I say all that is that I have worked for the, the manufacturers and also for the intermediaries in the, uh, in the distribution chain. And I also presented uh, workshops for Invest and I, been a mentor on various local programs and for Enterprise Ireland. So I hope I have learned something in that time, which, uh, which might be uh, useful for you. 
I should also say that I, uh, although I have some of the uh, academic accreditations you might expect, I'm not necessarily an advocate of the textbook ways. Uh, I think I've learned more on the street, so to speak. So my, ample, my examples in this uh, presentation are from my life experiences and may sometimes not be uh, consistent, I suppose, with the normal rules of engagement, but it's only my experience and um, other experts, uh, exporters may have uh, had a different one. So uh, uh, we'll stay on this one, Claire, yeah. So uh, where do we start from? Well, I suggest that we use the, I suppose, the accidental exporter as our start point. Uh, many of you may be this company. Uh, you can call it opportunistic, casual, even uh, reluctant. Um, essentially, you have somehow managed to secure an order from outside these shores, simply maybe in England or, or in the Republic, Republic of Ireland. It came about by chance, perhaps. Um, you fulfilled the order, perhaps a bit trepidatiously, uh, and you thought that was that. Uh, maybe there was a second order. Uh, the source of the order may have been a customer who has simply uh, inter uh, researched the internet or who had seen your product on a visit here uh, or who's referred to you or is an expat who wants to buy something he or she knows. There are many different ways that a customer might uh, get to you and uh, many of our exporters <coughs> start with this, uh, with this experience. Excuse me. <clears throat> so the customer may have seen a <clears throat> may have seen a price, maybe not. Maybe you have kind of winged it by offering a price that was higher than normal on the basis that it was a one-off and you might uh, just try to take advantage. And sure, if they take it, great. If they don't, that's also okay. Then you realize you've got to ship it. And that brings in other questions. How do I ship it? How much will it cost? Do I ask the, the customer to pay? And suddenly a 100 pound item becomes 150 pounds. Should the customer arrange to collect it themselves uh, with their own transportation? What documentation is needed? <clears throat> Are there duties and taxes? Although typically if you're sending a small item, there may not be any tariffs paid or VAT. Things often just slide and nobody takes uh, much notice. But what has happened here is that you've gone through the mechanics of fulfilling an export order at a low level. For you, it's probably been, been quite um, fraught, but uh, it's a single order. Um, you haven't gone out to find the customer and you don't know if there will be another one, but you have gone through some of the experience that exporters have. So the next question is, what do I do now? Maybe that wasn't a one-off. Maybe I can get more. And perhaps that is why some of you are here to help you work out what to do next and how to do it. Well, you could do a number of things. Uh, you can do nothing. You can continue with your own work locally that you know well and leave the exporting because it sounds too complicated and time consuming. You can continue as you are, taking the odd export order and fulfilling it as you did the first one. It's a bit of a hassle, but it's a few extra pounds that you didn't account for and effectively it's a bonus. But you don't put the effort into selling. If people like what they see, they can buy on the same terms uh, as everyone else. Uh, the, the third thing you could do is, is you have a taste for it and you want to pursue more. Uh, you've decided that there is a great opportunity out there that you cannot miss. Then you have to decide if you've got the energy and the money to put in the hard yards to get to market, whichever market that is. So I guess this the whole program and this webinar might help you decide uh, which of those routes uh, you want to take, uh, or even a completely different one. But we're going to make the assumption that you have taken the third option, which is that you've got a taste for it and you want more. So you're hungry and you think there's a, an opportunity. Uh, Claire? So you ask yourself, why do you want to export? Okay, you do have the taste for it, but really why do you want to do it? And at this point, I'd like to, you to just take a minute or so um, in the chat, uh, just to come up with uh, your ideas on why you want to export or why you are interested in exporting. Uh, 
So if you just just um, type in a few things there, and uh, Claire will be able to see them. <clears throat> Claire, if you could just we'll just give it a minute, and then if you could share a few of those with us. One response that's it's a bigger market. Yeah. Um, to reach new customers and markets. That's slow on it this morning. It's because yeah. it's, <laughs> it's at the beginning. People have to listen up a bit. Any more? To make more money, to increase sales, we have spare capacity. Maximize production capability, make a bigger impact in health. Actually, Claire, I can see those as they come through. Oh, well, that's great. Yeah, sorry, I didn't think I was going to be able to. Any more, just quickly? Okay, um, so some very valid reasons there. You've got extra production capacity. Uh, and you want to uh, fulfill it, um, you want to, largely most people want to increase sales uh, and also uh, could I in, in very um, bold letters there say also profit uh, and we'll get back to that a bit later. So yeah, so look, a number of reasons, you know, why you want to, why you want to, um, to export maybe out of necessity because the home market won't sustain the business. Uh, perhaps because you want to grow something big, you've you've got that ambition. Um, uh, perhaps the home market is uh, is saturated. You're maybe a little bored, or you want to stretch yourself. Um, is it because you need the economies of scale, or you have simply, you know, you spotted on holiday what looks like an opportunity, and that often happens. So these reasons are all um, valid. Um, and whatever the reason, it must be a good one and one which drives you to be successful. Uh, Claire, next slide. But please take note, uh, it will cost you to develop export markets in any meaningful way. It will cost money, first of all. So the type of things I'm thinking about are travel to go out there, uh, okay. Uh, there's also the possibility that you will need to modify your product or your service. You might need to uh, invest in greater capacity. Your marketing costs may be higher. You might have to work through intermediaries who require a slice of the pie, uh, which might reduce your margin. Uh, you might also be lucky and get able to get a higher price for your product. Uh, there's also cost in terms of time. Uh, it is not normally a fast process. Um, yes, sure, you can get the odd order or the odd gig here and there, but to be a real player in the market, it takes more time. So you have to ask yourself uh, if you've got the resource to do it. I, I've seen organizations where the company gives the task to somebody junior or as an add-on to existing responsibilities, rather than make the investment in a dedicated export uh, individual. I've also seen organizations where the export person is largely uh, peripheral to mainstream activities and as a result, doesn't have the influence within the company. So that person gets to know about all the export markets, but because this information is in a sense alien, I suppose, uh, to the rest of the company, then it is not uh, taken seriously. Other employees can identify with the other aspects of the company's business that they see daily, um, especially in a small company, but often find it hard to relate to, you know, what's going on in Germany or Scotland. So it, kind of gets talked about that things like, oh, well, well, Karen's doing something in Germany, but we really don't know what. So you need to dedicate some resource to it if you're serious. Uh, and it needs to be a, a proper uh, time commitment, you know, not just a, a number of hours in the week or the month uh, dedicated to the uh, export activity, but it has to be for a sustained uh, period. Um, that could be months, it could be even longer, it could be years, but you really have to give it a chance um, uh, you know, too often I, I heard stories of uh, people, say, coming back from a trade mission and uh, how did you get on? Well, I sent a few emails back, but nobody responded. You know, and then it just you slip back into the day-to-day the, the -day work. So you really have to 
put in some uh, effort to, to give it a chance. Uh, it usually takes a lot longer to achieve something in the export market. So I suppose I'm talking to, to those of you in the position of responsibility, the business owners, directors, senior managers, when I say that if you really want to make it work, you have to drive it. You have to ensure that the person or persons responsible for developing the export effort are included and given stage time within the company structure. So the selection of the right person for this export development role is also key. Uh, many years ago, and I give my age away, and some of you may recognize some of the words here, uh, the, I completed what was called the European Export Marketing Programme, a joint effort between the University of Ulster uh, and the uh, Training and Employment Agency, as it was, and I don't know what it's called now. But anyway, uh, also some local companies and the University of uh, Louvain in Belgium. So some of the criteria for selection onto that programme were about experience travelling, working abroad, speaking foreign languages, working independently and being adaptable, and an outward looking attitude, as well as the educational qualifications. So that view, that external view um, was valid then. And in my view, it is absolutely still valid. So it may be the case that uh, the internet has enabled us to do a lot remotely. And the fact that more and more people speak English as a second language means that travel and language aspects are less pronounced. But at some point, you will have to sit down in front of customers or potential customers, and you need the right individual to make that happen in the first place and to go the extra mile, often in uncharted uh, territory with a mobile phone and a laptop uh, and not being able to understand any of the signs around them. Uh, Claire? So uh, you've decided this is for you uh, and you have an idea of what you want to achieve, but not really much more. Um, in fact, there are more there are more questions than answers in your head. Where do I start? Which would be the first place to go to check out the market? Uh, have I got any clues or previous experience? Is there anyone I can ask? Um, is my product or service suitable for overseas markets? Uh, how will I get to the customers? If I do uh, establish that there is a market, is there an existing distribution network? Who are the key players? Is it the end user? Is there somebody in the distribution chain? What price will I be able to charge? Uh, should I just join an export program, get on a plane and go talk to some relevant people? And many, many more. So lots and lots of questions. Claire? Okay, so what do I need to know? Well, I, I really could go on uh, about a lot of things. Um, there's information all over the internet about what you might need to know. So you, you could go and, and, and Google export development plan or something, uh, and they'll tell you that. Um, it is not always relevant for every product or service. So uh, clearly what a missile manufacturer needs to know will be different from producer of baby foods or an environmental management service. So I'm not gonna cover all of the things uh, you could inform yourself about. I think you will probably know uh, what is important to you. Um, nevertheless, um, I would like to suggest uh, these uh, for a start and to uh, take a look at, uh, at some of them. Um, so uh, uh, Claire, if you could uh, just move on. So one of the first things uh, that you would look at is which market to select. Um, this normally means uh, which country. Uh, and there are many factor, uh, factors which can help you decide where to focus your attention. Uh, and these should be uh, investigated. So again, back in the chat uh, once more, if, um, if we could um, try and think of the things that you might need to know about a target market in order to help you decide if it's the right one. So think about some market you might be interested in going to. Uh, what do you need to know about that market to help you decide if it's the right one for you? So I'll give you a start. Uh, one thing would be size. 
So, you know, a small country or a small island may, you may feel maybe too small for you to, to, to look at and a big one may be too large. Okay, so a few things you need to know about the target, uh, the target market to help you decide if it's the right one for you. We'll just take a minute on that. Okay, so some coming in there, market financials, uh, competition, uh, what's the distribution channel, um, regulations, um, uh, taxes, market size you mentioned. Uh, yeah, so a number, a number of very, uh, very important things there. Um, and Claire, if we can just move on. So yes, so a uh, very important one is the is the market size. Um, the question is really how big is the pie that everyone else is eating from? Uh, that could also be, um, which I think people tend to look for, is uh, how similar is the market to our own, which is perfectly reasonable. It's often easier to go somewhere which looks like uh, your own home market. So that's typically why you know people go all around the, the two islands here. Um, uh, are there any legalities, which someone has mentioned about regulations? So uh, legalities around uh, your your product and bringing your product uh, in. I'm thinking of things like we have at the moment um, issues on bringing uh, phosphates into um, Nordic countries, uh, and they have to be transported specially. And you have to get special permissions. Uh, in other countries, that's not the case. Um, is it uh, culturally acceptable? Um, and that's kind of a little bit about the similarity to, to, to Northern Ireland. Um, so culturally and also um, uh, linguistically. Um, so services uh, which often involve um, a lot of uh, language communication, so training services, financials, um, legal services, tend to be exported to countries with the same language. So you often hear it talked about in very, very grand terms. We are exporting all over the world. Uh, USA, India, UAE, Australia, New Zealand. So this sounds really fantastic uh, that this is a global company, uh, but probably the company is in a sector which relies on users having English as a first language or a very heavy use of English, like uh, India and, and UAE. Um, it's also the case that ease of access to a market can narrow down the short list. Um, uh, I think Claire mentioned the uh, distribution channels. So how easy is it to get into? Um, obviously, GB and ROI stand out, but also countries like uh, the Netherlands and uh, Scandinavia. These countries are open for imports uh, and very accepting of uh, vendors from UK and Ireland, just depending on the product. Um, so I said it normally means uh, which country you go to, but not always. Um, you know, countries the size of uh, Sweden, for example, what, nine million people, and uh, ROI may be approachable as a whole. But I also often hear people talk about uh, conquering the USA or the US market. I want to conquer the US. Uh, it's very admirable. Um, but the fact is, it's just too big. It's too big and varied. Just think of the weather. You, you can't take it all on. So the old uh, question, how do I need an, how do I eat an elephant? Um, answer one bit at a time uh, applies. Um, so maybe it's wiser to look at uh, a small part of it. Um, so for example, the Boston area, which is very Ireland friendly, and there are other many highly populated areas on the Eastern uh, seaboard. Um, it's a federation of states, which have different laws, which also might affect your, your decision. We sell some products into the US as well from Europe, and uh, there are no uh, nationwide um, distribution channels uh, for our product. There's a couple of retailers, but most of the distribution channels are regional. 
and it's 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 for a reason. It's just easier to 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 be strong in your own local area. So uh, for those guys, so uh, you know, look at it as maybe uh, part of a, a country. Um, and often there are geographical centres of, of industry even within countries. So if you uh, think locally here at the materials handling equipment sector in Northern Ireland. I'm thinking of manufacturers of recycling equipment, uh, quarrying equipment. They're all, or most of them are based on the Western side of Loch Ness. Uh, so if you were, uh, say, a, a potential supplier um, of components from Germany to that sector, and you look to the UK and Ireland for your customers, your decision about where to target would probably be quite straightforward. You'd be you know, on a plane and getting off at the Belfast International Airport and just heading a few miles up the road. I mean, you could, flow, you could throw a blanket around uh, all of those companies. So geographical uh, competence within a, a country is also very helpful when you're targeting uh, a market. Um, I said I work in the, in the leisure marine sector. Um, if I look at France, uh, the concentration of larger boats is on the Mediterranean coast. And uh, while most of the boat building is on the west coast, just north of La Rochelle, but as manufacturing evolves, companies look to cheaper manufacturing locations. In our sector, much of the production has moved to Poland. So many big names in the sector are producing in the northeast of Poland, which has built up a competence in boat building in the last uh, 20 years. So we may target Poland. Actually, the products uh, end up being bought by French companies, Norwegian companies who have their, their manufacturing base there. Uh, so the choice of a target market uh, in a geographical sense, is a decision which can be much more than just pick a country. Claire? Okay, uh, so here is here when you pick a few countries, which you might do, uh, then uh, a good idea is to try and screen them, select them, prioritize, and try and pick one out. And here are uh, some of the um, some of the things you may look at. In terms of the information you need about your your uh, your target market and culture is a very big one, uh, and just at the bottom, you, you, you know, our information is not perfect, and it's often easier simply to choose a market similar to our own. And that that uh, I'm talking about really culture in that respect. Um, Claire. So one of your uh, one of your questions that you you might ask yourself uh, should be what am I going to export? And this may appear, appear to be a daft question. If you have only one product or service, uh, you know, here's what I have. You can have it in five different colors or, you know, that's the way it comes, sir. Um, but if that is not what the export market uh, wants, uh, what do you do? Uh, what if it's, you know, if it's just not right? So I'll give you a very simple example uh, of this. So at Whale, we made uh, pumps, for the marine market, as I said, manual and electric. So electric pumps were normally uh, 12 volts. Um, most of the market uh, that we were in was small boats up to about uh, 40 foot long. Uh, so we would provide these in, in 12 volts. So that was standard voltage in the small boats, fine. But some markets either had larger boats or had boat builders who built larger boats. Uh, and these boats used 24 volts. Uh, so Sorry, something has gone. Uh, so we had to produce the same product in, uh, we had to produce the same product, uh, thanks Claire, in 24 volts. It may sound like a straightforward swap of motors, but it isn't. The pumps had to perform the same way, but with uh, normally with increased capacity with a 24 volt motor on a bigger boat. All aspects had to be tested. And in some cases, component parts replaced because they behaved differently and operated by a 24 volt motor. This meant more costs to adapt the product, then finding a supply of second motors uh, instead of just the one, and potentially different component parts from different suppliers. So product adaptation can be a vital part of the export development process. It is not safe to assume that your existing product will cross uh, borders. Um, Claire? So here is a, a tool which may help you understand where you're at. Uh, you might have seen this, it's called Anzos Matrix. 
So essentially it combines uh, the two things I've just talked about, products and markets. Uh, firstly, you should be able to put yourself in at least uh, one of these boxes. And I suggest it's probably in the top left box where you have your existing product, you're selling it to your current market. Um, um, if that's Northern Ireland, if, you, if your current market is, is Ireland or is, is UK, whatever you might see as the home market. Then when you go into an export market, uh, you will go into the box um, below. You'll take existing products, but somewhere on that line, you may have to modify them and bring them into, uh, uh, into the, the new market. Uh, on the other hand, you may wish to develop, move, move left into the red circle and uh, in the current market, bring in new products. But just one, uh, I guess, word of warning, um, certainly going into an export market, uh, I think where you don't want to find yourself is in the bottom right hand uh, box. So taking your <clears throat> uh, existing or modified product to a new market is one thing but taking a completely new uh, product to a completely new market is different. Uh, and it's probably not a very safe or secure uh, place to be. You need to tread very carefully here uh, and you could have ended up losing your, uh, losing your shirt. Uh, okay, so you're not expected to know all of these things at the beginning of your, of your metaphorical uh, journey. You will learn these things as you go along. You probably need to set out a plan of export research and development, noting all the things you don't know uh, and trying to strike them off in, in, the, uh, in the research process. Um, Claire? So this plan can be as detailed or as sketchy as you wish, but it is the case that the better informed you are, the better the chance of success. Um, however, like everything, you can research and research and research so the cows come home without actually committing to doing anything. So there has to come a point where you decide to take some action. And that could be early in the process if you know the cost, uh, that the cost of your actions will not be great, if the risk is not great. So it could mean, you know, just identifying a few potential customers, jumping on a plane under a subsidized trade visit for a couple of days, and that might be a reasonable thing to do. Uh, I guess it's all about what you might lose if you try to enter a market without knowing it. So and on the other hand, a high risk venture uh, will require you to know a lot more uh, uh, about the market. Um, so uh, although I do have my export marketing diploma and my, I am a Chartered Institute of Marketing qualified, I am not of the view that um, a very detailed research project has to be carried out for most of our small companies. You simply don't have the time or the resources to do it, and you will get impatient uh, to get out there. These days, you can do loads of stuff on the web without even having to move. Uh, and also, research is not a, a discrete activity with a start and an end point. It's, uh, it's ongoing. Everywhere you go, everyone you speak to, you will learn something that you didn't know the day before. So that's why getting out and meeting people is so important. You get the opportunities you just wouldn't get sitting at home. Uh, Claire? So back to the pie again. Um, so there are some things uh, that you should try and find out uh, and quantify even roughly uh, where necessary. Uh, and one of these is, is, the, uh, is the market size. So, um, you know, how big is the pie that everyone is eating and sharing? Um, you, you probably know very little. Some, may, some of you may know more than others. Um, but just by way of example, to, to show how you can uh, kind of work out um, uh, market size, starting from not very much. So um, I mentioned pack flat. Uh, in Derry, I will have another little story about them a bit later, but uh, for the, uh, we, we decided to look at the French market for uh, election booths, um, that's what they made, election booths and election boxes. Uh, those are the two products we had. Uh, so we, we knew very little, you know, if not nothing, they had elections like everybody, um, but we didn't know how they were carried out uh, in detail. 
uh, we didn't know what was required of an election booth and how the market was structured. So uh, I needed a plan. So what time, uh, what type of things that I need to know? Well, market size. So what did I do? Well, I started with what I already knew uh, and roughly I knew what the voting population was. Um, then uh, a little bit of uh, internet research, I found out because there are regulations around this, uh, what the maximum number of uh, uh, voters per booth. So if there's you know, a thousand voters in a district, you need to have one booth. If there are more than that, so the 2000, you'd have two booths, et cetera. Um, I checked out what levels of government there are in France, and I was able to estimate how many elections there are per year. In France, there is a lot of government. So they have national, they have regional, they have provincial, and right down to mayoral uh, elections in very small towns uh, and villages even. So I could also estimate how long a booth like might last. The French booths had uh, textile curtains, which got musty and smelly in between times. So life was only a few, few years. So literally on the back of an envelope, I was able to establish uh, roughly the market size. I didn't need to spend weeks trying to find it out, and I don't suggest you do either. Work it out roughly. You will probably find it's quite big, uh, uh, certainly big enough uh, for you to take a small, a small uh, morsel, uh, and that could make a huge difference to your business. Claire? So as time goes on, eventually you get to the point where you can uh, make decisions based on your experience and, you know, you will get to the point where you can work things out very quickly in your head. Um, at Whale, we decided we should have a, a new electric uh, bilge pump of our own design. Uh, a bilge pump removes the water from inside of the boat at the bottom. So it gathers there over time due to rain, waves, leakages, etc. <clears throat> so now I didn't have a, uh, a complete marketing research project to work out, you know, uh, if it was worth doing. I didn't need one. I knew roughly how many boats there are in Europe and the US. Uh, and the world, uh, I knew, so I knew market size. I knew roughly the breakdown in terms of boat length and therefore sizes of pumps required. That's why we end up with these three sizes. Uh, I knew competitors' prices. I knew distribution routes because we were already there uh, and how many noses there were in the trough, so to speak. So where my price needed to be and hence roughly what my cost needed to be to make a profit. So I probably could have worked this you know, I'd done the back of a cigarette packet um, if I was a smoker. Uh, uh, but that was because we as the company knew the market well and you will progress towards that where it will be easier uh, for you to make these, uh, make these calculations. Um, so more questions. <clears throat> market dynamics. Um, who are the customers, the end users? How is this need satisfied right now? Who are the players in the market? Uh, yeah, no, I think go back one, Claire. Yeah, I'll say there. Um, um, trade barriers. Um, is my product going to be too expensive? Uh, will it be sellable? Will I have to alter it? Are there any technical aspects that I should, should know about? So effectively, is my product going to be sellable? Okay. And uh, Back to the voting booth, the voting booths uh, for a packed flat in, in France uh, on this particular aspect. So I didn't know what the technical requirement was for the uh, voting booths. Um, on the left uh, are the packed flat booths and the packed flat boxes. Um, and uh, this is what they, they you know, they look like. Um, this is how we presented them in the UK and, and, and we've been getting on with that, uh, that business. Um, so a quick internet search uh, on the booths in France uh, and I discovered that they look like those on the right of your picture. And I just wondered why? Why are these so different? Why do they look like this and they don't look like ours? Um, is it a legal requirement? Is it a culture? Is it evolution? Um, so I needed to understand what a French election uh, looks like. So what do people actually do when they walk into a polling station? Uh, now you've all done it here, and I use this example because you all know voting, um, uh, but it's a bit different in France. In France, there are two principles which appear to contradict each other. The first is absolute secrecy. 
And the second is absolute openness. So the absolute secrecy comes in making your selection. Um, so therefore they have a completely surrounded voter apart from the top. Uh, they're making the choices hidden from everybody's view. So curtains up to about uh, two meters. And then openness in terms of recording the vote. So this means a clear uh, ballot box so the officials could see the paper go in and with a counter to record each ballot paper. There's a little counter in the middle at the top of that box. Uh, so there's the pack flat box and uh, booth and there's the French one. And as you can see, our stuff met none of the French requirements. Okay. It didn't need to. We don't have those rigid uh, principles that they do in France. Uh, so very quickly, I got to understand some of the technical requirements of a French booth. The principles of secrecy and openness are in law. And so some of the technical requirements of the booth and the ballot box were specified in law, and they were very different from those in the UK, as you can see. Anyway, what is the point of the story? Well, it is that clearly the product I was going to have to sell was different from the one I had anticipated offering to the market. Um, and what did this piece of crucial information mean for the company? Well, firstly, it understood French requirement is very different. Simply to take our own product and introduce it would not be uh, the wise thing to do. It left for them a few other questions. What do we do with our product? Can we adapt it to suit the market? Uh, what are the amendments we need to make? Or do we have to make a completely new product? The answer was that some amendments could be made, a completely new product that was not required. Uh, but the bigger question was whether they or not they wanted to spend the money to make the necessary amendments for a market they knew little about. Okay, they could have put somebody on it uh, technically, but that meant taking away from another part of the business, possibly from the regular business, the bread and butter. I say this because this may be a question for you as you progress your export effort. The decision is one of return on investment. Will the time and money spent on these changes and this effort be rewarded with sales? So the answer to that question uh, was not easy. And uh, I, I said about trying to find out a couple of things about the market without getting uh, bogged down in a lot of detail. Claire? So here are a few things that I uh, needed to know. Um, I needed to know what price uh, we might be able to charge and how I would get the, the product to market. I needed to know how the market uh, would work. Who is in it? Who are the main players? What's the structure? What's the competition? Um, how do people buy? All of these things. And again, uh, assuming the UK model was, was, model was not wise. So I tried to find out about the market structure. I made some inquiries, largely internet searches, and I spoke to a few people uh, in the know. In the UK, it is the council which buys the election equipment. Uh, sorry, that's in GB. In Northern Ireland, uh, it's a tender. Uh, over the, the, the whole of the <coughs> whole of North Ireland, one tender, uh, which incidentally we won the last one. Um, but in the in the in GB, it's the council who buys them, and typically they, they place good orders. I remember going to an election conference in Bangor, where the council staff would come up and say things like, "We need fifty election booths." One council asked for three hundred, uh, and they're priced at I think it's something like three hundred quid each. Um, so I was amazed. I mean, it looked really easy. Uh, I've just, I discovered in France that the purchasing decisions are often made much further down the line. It depends on the election. French elections are held at a very local level, which can be town or village, as well as national. So, and responsibility lies with the organizers. So there are many more purchasers, but they buy much smaller quantities. In the UK, it was relatively straightforward, with the benefit of uh, 30 years in the market, to get to the councils directly. In France, with potentially thousands of purchasers, it was not, and mostly they purchased online. Um, next slide, please, uh, Claire. Uh, so I wonder if you can click on that, Claire. So here is uh, here's how it looks in uh, here's how it looks in France. Um, I did my research. There's there's a dozen websites like this. Um, 
So they all by and large sell the same things, just made by different uh, different uh, producers. So, uh, but, but it was not a clear picture. Prices varied for the same product depending on the source, and you may, may also find that yourselves that things are not nice and neat. Uh, the price research was straightforward, and everything, everything was online. Customers bought election equipment through the retailers, uh, which were selling items used in the public sector. Uh, there were lots of them selling mainly the same stuff. Um, so I was lucky this information was available. It may not be to you. Someone mentioned taxes earlier on. Uh, French uh, VAT is 20-odd uh, percent. Um, so uh, rough 20.6 percent, I think. So similar to ours, but other countries have differing uh, VAT rates. Um, so the next question was key. So I knew my cost price to make it. And now I know roughly the end user price, but I don't know how much of the margin in between that I could get. And this was one of the additional stresses on the export effort. In the UK, we went direct to the customer. In France, there were intermediaries all looking for a piece of the action. And the web shop was one. How much did they charge per sale? Would they warehouse the product or simply take the order and we would have to ship it to the customer? So bearing in mind the order could be for two or three booths. How do we handle this from our factory? Uh, can we ship directly from the factory or do we need to put a warehouse in, in France? So suddenly there are extra costs involved in this and this is where the export effort can come unstuck. So the structure of the market needs to be understood. In addition, uh, the UK market was split between a couple of suppliers and we were by far the most dominant. In France, there turned out to be many manufacturers and many resellers. Perhaps a good sign that the market is vibrant and attractive. We would simply be another manufacturer, albeit with a reasonably unique product, despite the amendments. So that was the question for us. Do we think the market is too crowded? These are mostly French manufacturers and they have an advantage over us in many ways. Proximity, therefore quicker to market. Cost of transport, language, local knowledge, and ability to service the business. Uh, next slide, please, Claire. Thanks. So, and who are we? You know, where would we fit in? You know, it's imperative that you try and make an honest assessment of your current place in the world to help you decide what next steps to make. For most of you uh, looking at the export opportunities from outside, you will probably be able to work out that you are not in anybody's vision, that you have no presence, probably, that nobody knows you and nobody cares, nobody's thinking about you. So why would they? So that is the position from which you will enter the market and will have to make your way. So it's important to understand this uh, fully to get a grasp on the nature of your export task and your start point. One of your key questions will be uh, how to service the business. What if something goes wrong? How will you respond to customer complaints and questions? How will you provide backup? One of the most important criteria is language. If you're selling in UK and Ireland, that is easy. But if your customers are elsewhere, perhaps not so much. And this can determine your route to market. If you go to the next slide, please, Claire. So I worked, I worked as a mentor uh, for a company, um, it's a startup uh, uh, years ago, which wanted to sell its newly designed product. This isn't it, this is just a, a, another picture of another one. A hitch for towing caravans um, uh, uh, around Europe. And uh, the end user profile was typically um, over 50s, often retired, a couple who want their caravan life to be a little bit easier. This was an automatic hitch uh, as they get less, uh, less strong. So he decided that he wanted to sell direct to customers in Germany and to support them. That's how he would uh, maintain his, uh, his margin. Uh, so can you imagine the phone conversation uh, when the 65 year old caravan owner, owner with no English uh, in a village in Bavaria wants some assistance to resolve a technical issue with his product? It just wasn't practical. You would need a number of able German speakers with technical knowledge to do this. So he had to rethink his, his plan. So some companies do have high levels of English. Uh, I've already mentioned uh, Holland and uh, Scandinavia, and some do expect to carry out business in English. People do all the time, 
I was at a, a trade show in Amsterdam just a couple of weeks ago where, you know, at the B2B B2 B2 level, a Dane and a Greek will conduct business in English, uh, a Pole and a Spaniard the same. But at end user level, it is not like that. So you may get some sales and some people may be happy to do business on your terms. But to really penetrate the market, you have to be more available. So this is an important criteria in your choice of route to market. And again, it comes back to your place in the world. You were almost invisible and you will more than likely need the help of other people to get your profile and represent you in an export market. And that costs. And that is why I said earlier that you need to examine whether you can, whether or not you can profitably do business in export markets. You may need an intermediary, and these come in many forms, distributor, agent, licensee, retailer, online bricks and mortar, third-party logistics, or simply a warehouse. The choice depends on many factors. I could probably run a whole seminar, but I would like to give you one simple mathematical example. Okay, uh, and it's to do with the, uh, the uh, comfort seat uh, product. So I think we'll go to the next slide, Claire. Okay, so uh, we'll just take a quick look at this. Um, so we look at the top, uh, home, we've got home market and export market, consumer buying price the same, never mind taxes for now. Um, retailer buys at that, uh, 70. Uh, and you have no distributor in the home market because it's small and you can go directly to retailers, okay? But in the export market, you have to put another intermediary in there to help you because all these retailers are all over Italy or they're all over Holland or they're all over England and you just can't get to them um, uh, effectively. So distributor buys at a lower price and suddenly, suddenly the margin that you make on your product from the home market to the export market falls dramatically. And in this case, it's fallen by, by half in terms of, of numbers and by a significant percentage. So this is something you've got to consider when you are looking at um, your distribution channel into the, uh, into the export markets. Okay, so we also touched a little bit on, uh, on buying behavior. We're getting close to the end now, so just bear with us. We also touched a little bit on, on buying behavior, um, how do customers buy? I mentioned in the UK, it is the councils who buy the product and they are a manageable number. Pack fats and approved supplier, and the process is easy. Order quantities can be good. In France, it's all web sales, and the quantities can be small. So the web shop is probably the gatekeeper, but they have a lot of power because they decide what they put on their website. And maybe they don't want anybody else. Maybe they've got enough. Who knows? So it's important to understand the purchasing process, which can be different in an export market. The process of actually deciding whether or not to take on the product uh, and not the mechanics of placing an order. So again, it's understanding your place in the world. And if we can move on to the, the next slide, uh, Claire. So please, when you're, when you're thinking about the, uh, the purchasing process, and if you only remember one thing from today, that is try as best you can to make yourself easy to buy from. Don't make life difficult for uh, purchasers. Any of you who work with retailers, with large retailers here in Northern Ireland will know that if you're selling to the large, to Henderson and Musgrave and the like, you have to make yourself easy to buy from. And it's no different in the, in the export market. So as an as a action to do, you might want to go away and just sit down and think about what can you do to make yourself easy to buy from. So one of the things that uh, smooth uh, business from us, if you go to the next slide, um, Claire. Uh, one of the things that, that smooth business from us for many years was the EU, uh, but that has now been uh, thrown up in the air a bit. I'm going to finish on this. Um, uh, that has been thrown up into the air um, in the last number of years, our relationship with the EU. So uh, Brexit has given us lots of uncertainties, but I just want to give you an example of how it, it can work. Um, uh, they, they talk about the unique position of, of Northern Ireland. There are some difficulties, uh, of course, uh, which our friends in, uh, in Westminster and in Brussels are trying to work through. 
But uh, for us right now, for the company I work with, um, Nixon Marine Global, which is a little small company in, in Carador, importing from the US and selling into Europe, the protocol has actually worked well for us. Um, we are effectively the point of entry into Europe. So we can bring in product from the US, get it all custom cleared, and send it on to both to GB and uh, to the rest of Europe, usually via Dublin or via Rosslare. We, we try to avoid uh, GP for that. Um, uh, and we can do the same for the products to, to GB from, from, uh, from Belfast or Larne. So despite the uh, disruption and the headaches, it can work for you if you're in export markets. The idea of you know selling into Europe um, and taking the taking the route, um, avoiding GB uh, and going into into France. Um, there are uh, I think it's the Institute of Export or is it the or is it the the government run um, have, have a trade advisory service for this? I can't remember what it's called. Claire might be able to might know better. Uh, and they're very good. We use them um, to get up to speed on all the um, on all the aspects you need. You get a you get a different VAT number, a VAT number which begins, I think it's XI or XO, um, rather than GB, and you use that uh, on all your documentation, and that uh, smooths away a lot. So, Northern Protocol, some problems, but it can be very useful. And, and lastly, I'm just going to not going to go through these. So take take the next slide, um, Claire, and I'll just leave you with it. You can ponder these yourself. And um, I'll just uh, leave that there. Um, and that's me, that's me finished. I hope that was in some way uh, useful. Maybe went a little bit over time. Um, Claire, thank you. Sorry, thanks, Paul. Um, that provided a deep dive taster session um, into the basics. Um, but if you don't mind, if you can stay with us in the background and right. uh, the scenes there um, to join us shortly for the Q&A session, um, that would be great. Um, so as Paul outlined, there's so much um, to take in, but the scariest part is taking that first step. And that's where the, the Armagh, Van Bridge and Craig Avon Council's Transform Your Business Programme can help. Um, it offers a full range of free mentoring support that can support businesses in the borough to navigate their exporting journey. The Early Export Stream can provide support in researching and identifying potential export market opportunities, marketing your product overseas, demystifying your, the export bureaucracy, you know, the market regulations, logistics and paperwork, and helping you to identify sources of um, finance for export. So I'm just going to share my screen here again. Just bear with me a second. Um, so as part of the Early Export Programme, we'll, we can also guide you through and signpost you to and help you access the range of supports available, which include um, the great resource, which is the Northern Ireland Business Info website. Um, there's a range of support available for new and established businesses to help you start trading successfully outside of Northern Ireland. And the resource um, through NI Business Info um, kind of provides, you know, highlights the various export training programmes and details um, that are of available financial support for exporting and uh, research support for exporting. Also Invest NI, they provide a range of support from practical um, export skills workshops right through to the trade advisory service that helps to research competitors and markets. And they also have the business info center that provides access to market research um, and company information databases. And you may also be able to access their graduate export program um, Intertrade Ireland, um, they help firms gain the knowledge, skills and capability to access cross-border market support. Um, so supporting companies who are interested in, in trading um, from Northern Ireland to Ireland um, to help them develop and win new business through their sales development programs, such as the Trade Accelerator Voucher, Acumen, Elevate, Emerge programs. Um, and 
there's a new service also available called the UK Export Academy. So from the Department for Inter International Trade, it gives businesses the know-how to sell to customers around the world by learning from experts in international trade. Um, the academy has been designed to accommodate different levels um, of exporting experience, whether your business is interested in starting to sell internationally or looking to grow your international sales further. So th there's a range of support available um, through that. And following on from, from today's webinar, we will share um, all these um, links and, and the slides with you. And Paul also mentioned um, through the UK government, um, uh, there's also the Export Support Service. Um, the UK businesses selling goods or services to Europe, you can contact the UK government export support team by phone or online. Um, they answer any question um, uh, around exporting to new markets, the paperwork you need um, to sell your goods abroad and or the rules for specific countries um, where you want to sell. Um, services or products. So their export service team try to answer your questions online, but if they can't, then they guarantee that they will be back in touch with you with an answer to your question within three days. Um, so if you're thinking um, about um, starting to explore new markets, then the Transform Your Business Early Export Programme is for you. The eligibility, you know, to be eligible um, for support, businesses have to be based in the borough, employ less than 50 employees and should not be an Invest NI client. And in some cases, if Invest NI aren't able to provide you with support, they will um, also um, uh, will, will confirm that you can come on the programme. So, you know, what are you waiting for? Submit your application um, to the Transform Your Business programme, early support early export support today through the council's website. All the details are on screen now and we'll include them um, in, in the follow-up um, after today's webinar. And then additional to the early export support stream um, that we've talked about today, I also want to highlight the full range of free mentoring support available to businesses in the borough through the, 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 the streams um, on Transform Your Business. It's a tailored suite of support. Um, all, all the services are on screen now, and it offers free mentoring to businesses across all sectors, ranging from innovation, early export, digital transformation, and growth to, to it's easy for me to say, um, and uh, specific support for young entrepreneurs and also social enterprises. So I'd like to invite Paul back on screen um, now just to answer any burning questions that anybody may have. Hi, Paul. Um, Morning. Uh, a couple of questions. Some of you, you've already answered uh, here, Paul. Um, obviously, there's a lot of questions about the implications for the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, do you think it's a positive thing? Do I think it's a positive thing? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I, being entirely selfish uh, with, with what I'm doing, yes, it, it is a positive thing. Um, I do accept that other people may not may not find it um, thus, but yeah, principally in, in, in terms of exporting, uh, and that's what we're talking about here. Um, uh, it is it is yeah, the, the, uh, probably the best we could uh, um, we could get um, from the uh, from the situation. Obviously, again, uh, leaving aside any political things, the the um, you know having smooth uh, um, EU. Um, uh, smooth business from within the EU would be better um, for for most trading companies, um, but uh, with what we have, um, the, the protocol does does work well. And the the um, the what's the name of the service today? The export um, the export um, export the, advisory service. Uh, the export government one. Service. Yeah, they they yeah. are very good at talking people through. They uh, one of the girls who worked with us, she went through the whole thing. Of uh, you know, finding out what we needed to do um, to ensure that our products were accepted as tariff free in in, in Europe, and uh, we found it very 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 useful. So we don't have any bringing stuff and moving out. We don't have any any trouble. Right. I think it was purely from a business perspective. The question was. Yeah. Um, yeah. You've talked a lot about products. Are there any uh, restrictions on selling services internationally that you've come across? 
don't think so. No, um, uh, I've looked at selling some. I'm, I'm probably mostly a products guy, but um, uh, no, the, the, the difficulty with services, um, which I did allude to in the presentation, I think is probably language. I mean, you know, most of our services are, are about the communication and um, uh, you, you probably need to have um, a local um, partner to, to, to help you. You know, with products, you might not always need a local partner, but I think generally with services uh, you do. One of the, one of the business I, I looked at, um, we looked at a little bit of Germany and we just found we weren't going to be able to do anything. We were going to have to write uh, reports, give advice. We, we couldn't do it in English. <laughs> so, um, so that would be a restricting factor, I, I think, um, unless you want to go to the, the, the Anglophone uh, uh, countries. Um, mm. But, but um, generally, I don't think there's any, any particular um, uh, um, restriction on, on services. I suppose a follow on question to that there is somebody said, how do I select a potential overseas partner and, as an agent or distributor or something like that for the pitfalls? Yeah, yeah, that's a <clears throat> that's a very um, tricky one. I guess the, the the most important piece of advice I could give was is don't go to the first guy who comes up and talks to you. <laughs> okay, um, people come, they promise you the world. Say we this, they want they see a new product, something that's new to their country. They want to be first in it. Don't just say right. Oh, I've got somebody who's going to sell it for me. Because um, that is that is a, an, an easy uh, an easy thing to do. You you, you know if someone sells a few bits and pieces for you. And you think, okay, this is great. Uh, I've got a guy in I've got a guy in in the Netherlands. I've got a guy in uh, in Dubai. Um, but you need to get to know the person uh, or, or the company, uh, and you need to even before that you need to carefully uh, look at um, how how you want to get to the market. Very often it's defined for you. There is a a tried and trusted way into a market. I talked about the French uh, or web sales. Other countries that can be standard, uh, traditional distribution. Other country, other other uh, places that can be through agents. So there may be already uh, existing uh, ways in, um, in which you would just tend to. I would imagine you tend to follow those rather than try and break the mold. Um, but just be careful about your selection of of partner. You know, I, I've heard many stories, and I've fallen in the trap myself, where I've, someone has gone, "Oh, I don't, Craig, I don't have a, don't have anybody in that country. Great, this guy looks good. You know, let's, let's, let's get him going," uh, and then nothing happens. Okay. Um, so, um, yeah. an, an, another, there's been a lot of pitfall questions here. If I'm exporting outside of the pound, euro, or dollar zones. What currency should I use? And is it worth buying currency in advance? Uh, can be worth buying currency. Very often, you know, you need to have a lot of money to do that. Um, uh, small companies often don't, and they tend to just um, uh, quote prices often uh, by order. You know, sometimes it's difficult to say this is our price for the year because the currency may change. Um, the standard currencies go often wherever in, in, in countries where which are not pound, which are not euro, which are not which are not you dollar using dollars matter of course. The dollar often goes, you know, it'll go in it'll go in, in, in many countries in Europe, it'll go in Russia. Uh, uh, practically any country that I deal with will take will take US dollars. Okay. Um, um, they will generally take euro pound. Not so happy, but that also goes back to the, the thing that I mentioned about making life easy for the purchaser. You know, you may have to just take that that hit rather than saying, oh, my prices are in pounds. <clears throat> uh, you may have to just manage that and say, okay, I'm going to deal in your currency. What currency would you like? You know, um, uh, but I, I would avoid, you know, obviously, you know, stick to the main ones. Yeah, stick, okay. to, stick to the pound, the euro uh, and the US dollar. And what if my customers don't pay? Um, <clears throat> what can, what well, can... uh, I would be very strongly uh, advising that in the beginning, until you learn more about somebody, that you get payment in advance. Okay. Uh, it's just too. It's just too tricky. It's too tricky. You know, someone just doesn't pay. Um, might be difficult, but 
they'd be understandable, I think, mostly, you know, and maybe after two, three orders and maybe you've been to see them and you get to know them a bit better, uh, you might give them, um, you know, 50% now, 50% later, or you might put them on, on credit terms. But I think mm -hmm. in the beginning, um, unless you know different, you know, unless you've got other experience, good experience, I would say try and get payment up front. Okay, we're coming to the end of our time. So two very quick answers. What does a customs agent do and do I need one? Um, customs agent makes sure that um, all your paperwork is is uh, is right. Uh, for Europe, if you go and do the um, uh, to the, the service we mentioned earlier, the government service, um, you can do it yourself. Um, and if you're going to do lots of orders abroad, that's 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 uh, that's the way to go. You can go to the, the Chamber of Commerce, and they have a service um, to do that as well. Um, there may also be customs agents who act as private businesses, which will cost. So I, I would I would suggest that the best way to do it is to learn how to do it yourself. Okay, and. Um Finally, someone's asking about being an early exporter. Back to our program. Is Amazon a good way to export for early exporters? Yeah, I've looked, I've looked at this. Um, I don't know is the answer. Just our experience was, that we, well, most people will know more about Amazon than me, but you know, they, I know they've got different ways of, of doing business. So you can, you can you know, take, they take the order and you can drop ship it. You, you ship it yourself to, to the time. That costs a bit. Uh, or you can have the, I think, what do they call it? Fulfillment by Amazon, FFA, uh, where they they take your product and they stock it. Uh, that is littered with costs. Costs for absolutely every transaction that happens. Well, someone, you know, opens a box, you pay for it. If someone moves it from one part, one shelf down to another, you pay for it. Um, so the costs can rack up. And, um, and then also what might happen is, if you're going, the last thing, if you're going through Amazon and you also seek another uh, option, another a distributor or another representative, they may not like you selling on Amazon, even though the sales might be quite low, they often get turned off. So, oh no, you're, you're available on Amazon. Okay. So, so the answer is I don't know, but those are some of my experiences. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, Time really flies in and that brings us to the end of today's webinar. On behalf of myself and Barney of Innovate NI and our Mass City, Banbridge and Craig Avon Council teams, I'd like to sincerely thank the Lord Mayor, Glenn Barr and Paul Harding for joining us today and of course um, yourselves. And I hope this has given you all the incentive to take the next step and apply for the Transform Your Business programme and the suite of, of, of mentoring support that's available to you to help you on your journey. If you require any further information on what you've heard today and would like to avail of the support offered, then I would encourage you to submit an expression of interest form um, application. Um, and I've included, I'll include a direct link uh, to the application in the chat um, shortly, and we'll send out further details direct to your inboxes later on today. Um, so all's left for me to do is to thank you, our attendees, for joining us um, and investing the time to join us this morning. Um, and enjoy the rest of your Tuesday. Thank you. Good luck, everyone. Thank you, everybody.